Okay, so let's begin. This is going to be the next section, which is section 3.1 in the notes. In other words, the LSZ reduction formula. Okay, so what we would like to do, the sort of basic question we want to answer in particle physics is something like the following. Imagine that you smash together two protons. Okay, so you have two protons. Here are two protons and you smash them together and all kinds of stuff happens and then things come out. And we want to ask something like, what is the probability that a Higgs comes out given that I put in two protons with some momenta, k, i, and so on and so forth. This is the sort of question that we'd like to answer in quantum field theory. We want to find some probability of the following form. Now, to understand this, what we have to do is make a connection between the following ideas. We need to make a connection between matrix elements of single particle states and things that we know how to calculate in quantum field theory, in other words, time-ordered correlation functions. So the connection between these two things is done using the LSZ reduction formula. And again, you've seen a, a little bit of this in, uh, in IFT. I'm going to uh, do it again in a slightly different and more explicit way. And if you're interested, the treatment I'm going to follow is basically in chapter five of the textbook by Srednicki. And that chapter is in a PDF uh, attached to this page. Okay, so let's get started. I'm going to work out everything in example using the theory above. And I'm going to consider two to two scattering in lambda phi to the fourth theory. Okay, two to two scattering means that I throw in two phi quanta and then something happens and two phi quanta come out, and I want to understand the probability for this sort of process to happen. Okay, now because we're discussing states, I have to return to the canonical formalism for a second. So recall in the canonical formalism that you're all familiar with in IFT, we have these fields phi, which are Heisenberg operators, and you can expand these fields in terms of uh, raising and lowering operators. So for example, we have the following formula. P e to the minus i p dot x. I'm running out of space. Dagger e to the plus i p dot x. And that's a p dot x. I'm running off the edge of the screen here. And um, in particular, this is a four momentum. It's a four product. And the components of that four momentum are omega sub p and p vector. And omega sub p is root p squared plus m squared. Okay, now this is a formula that expresses phi in terms of A. It is easy to solve this. You can invert this to find A as a function of phi. So let me not go through that. It's not so complicated. What you do is you just do an inverse Fourier transform. You can all sort through these things yourself. And what you find is this. omega sub p of phi. Okay. So um, just to give you a little bit more detail about how to do this, what you do is you have phi, take its time derivative, and that will give you a slightly different linear combination of a and a dagger. And then you can solve those linear equations for a and a dagger separately, and you get this formula right here. Uh, there's a nice way to write this, which is the following. You can write this in the following way going to write this like d3x e to the i p dot x partial t double headed arrow times phi where this double headed arrow right here is just a notational thing so for example if you have f double headed arrow g that means f dg minus df times g okay and you can see that this double-headed arrow here, uh, when it acts on the phi, it brings down this dt phi. When it acts on the other thing, it brings down this omega p. Okay, so that's why this double-headed arrow is useful. Okay. 
Okay, now let's move on, introduce some more technical baggage. It turns out that for technical reasons, we are going to want to have wave packets. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, you know, the, um, this A sub P that we have right here, this A sub P is a state that is in a momentum eigenstate. In other words, it has a very specific momentum given by P. I want to imagine that are not exactly momentum eigenstates, but instead have some kind of a spread in momentum about some central value, okay? So for example, here's some central value, K1. You can imagine a Gaussian envelope for that wave packet. So F1 of K is something like, um, let me replace this with a squiggle. It's something like a Gaussian envelope with some width given by sigma. Okay? It's just some sort of Gaussian envelope with a width sigma. Uh, the precise form of this does not matter, but the fact that it's not a delta function is going to be important. Okay? Given this function f of k, we can now construct a smeared momentum operator, so rather, excuse me, a momentum smeared creation operator. And this momentum smeared creation operator is for example, a one dagger is just defined as taking the usual momentum operator and smearing it with this function. So this creates a state in some superposition of momenta given by this, uh, this function right here. Okay, now um, we all sort of need to come to a, a philosophical point. What I want to do is understand how initial states uh, evolve with time. In the free theory, we know that we use the creation operators to create particles. That's the definition of the creation operator. What about in the interacting theory? Is this still true? What we're going to do is we are going to assume that in the interacting theory, we still create our initial states with these creation operators, okay? So we assume that in the interacting theory, initial states are created by these creation operators in the distant past. This is important. It's an initial state. So it's important that we create it in the distant past as t goes to minus infinity. And furthermore, we're going to assume that it does so up to an overall factor. which I'm calling Z, okay? In other words, my initial state is given in the following way. If I want to have an initial state with a wave packet around K1, then that initial state is given by one over the square root of Z, limit as T goes to minus infinity of A1 dagger acting on the vacuum. Okay. This is in a sense an assumption, but basically this assumption means that the asymptotic structure of the states is not completely destroyed by the new idea of the interaction. Okay. You have to make such an assumption to make progress. And it may not be clear, but this Z turns out to be exactly the same Z that we talked about earlier when discussing this uh, spectral density. It is really just the probability that you make the initial state using your field phi. Okay. Okay, so what are we interested in? Recall we're looking at two to two scattering. That means what I really want is my initial state to be initial state of two particles. In other words, it's going to be limit as t goes to minus infinity, acting with two of these guys on the vacuum. So let me call them a1 dagger and a2 dagger on zero. So this is my initial state of two particles
Okay. They have momentum k1 and k2. And now I also want a final state. My final state, as you can imagine, will be described in a very similar way. My final state is described in the future. So it's limit as t goes to plus infinity, 1 over z, times a1 prime dagger, a2 prime dagger, I do on the vacuum. And these 1 prime and 2 prime denote the momenta of the final state. So k1 prime and k2 prime. And again, these are wave packets around these momenta. Now, the amplitude that we are looking for, we are looking for the probability that the initial state of two particles, momenta k1 and k2, turns into this final state of two particles, momenta k1 and k2. So we are looking for an expression for the following inner product, just f dash i. In other words, it's the following object. It's 1 over root z to the fourth vacuum times a1 prime of infinity, a2 prime of infinity, times a1 dagger minus infinity, a2 dagger to minus infinity, acting on the vacuum. These arguments denote the time, uh, the value of t at which we are evaluating these operators. Okay, and finally, let me point out that everything here is time ordered already. These guys are to the past of these guys. And therefore, I can stick a time ordering value in here with no problem because it's already time ordered. This turns out to be a very useful trick for what happens. Okay, so now what we're trying to do is we want to express this matrix element in terms of the field phi. Okay, so here I have these operators, a1, a2, a1 prime, a2 prime. I want to use the formula that I derived previously. In other words, this formula right here. Use that formula to express everything here in terms of the field phi. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, the way to do that, it turns out, is to first write down a formula that relates the creation operator in the distant past to the creation operator in the distant future. In other words, I want a formula for this object here. Okay, so uh, at this moment, I'm going to pause. I want everyone to try this now. Try to write a formula that relates this to this in terms of the field phi in space-time, okay? Now, uh, this is a bit tricky. This is uh, what L, S, and Z basically did. So if you have trouble, uh, which you, you might well have trouble, then please just take a look at the next thing of notes, which walks you through it step by step. And I'll let you do that, and I'll resume again after you have this expression.